Uh, well, good morning, everyone. I think we're going to go ahead and get started here. Uh, welcome to CSIS. I'm Connor Savoy. I'm a senior fellow here with the Project on Prosperity and Development. It's my pleasure to have you join what I think is going to be a great event today on innovation and global development. It's a big topic. It means a lot of things to different people. Um, but we have a great panel um, <clears throat> that's going to help unpack this, converse, this uh, topic with me today. But first, we're going to hear from Congressman Joaquin Castro, Democrat of Texas, who recently introduced alongside Congresswoman Young Kim, Republican of California, the Fostering Innovation and Global Development Act, or FIGDA. Um, FIGDA is an attempt to um, advance innovation at the U.S. Agency for International Development, um, and I would say try to embed it far more in the work that the agency does. Um, Congressman Castro is in his sixth term, representing the 20th Congressional District of Texas. Prior to that, he served five terms in the Texas House of Representatives. In Congress, he serves as a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee and the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. Uh, in these roles, the congressman has been a steadfast champion for principled American engagement abroad. And those of us who follow U.S. global development policy know that he's been a strong supporter of these efforts. So it really is my pleasure today to welcome Congressman Castro to CSIS. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Good, good. Well, first of all, Connor, thank you for that very kind introduction. And thank you to CSIS for hosting this much needed uh, conversation about the value of promoting innovation in our approach to foreign assistance. I'm Joaquin Castro, and I represent my wonderful hometown of San Antonio, Texas. Uh, and I'm very proud to be in my sixth term in Congress. In this Congress, I serve as ranking member of the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on the Western Hemisphere and as a senior member of the Subcommittee on the Indo-Pacific. And I'm also in my fourth term on the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. In the last Congress, as chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on International Organizations, International Development, and global, global Corporate Social Impact, I convened a number of hearings and briefings to assess the current state of U.S. foreign assistance. I was interested in candid conversations about our current approach to foreign assistance, particularly on where it works, where it doesn't, and where we need to improve and get better. The United States, as you all know, is the largest contributor to bilateral foreign assistance, and we're the only nation in the world with the power to mobilize the world around sustainable development, these sustainable development initiatives that can transform millions of lives around the world. So I'm very proud of the work we do as a nation, but I know, and I believe that many of you know, that we can do it more effectively. In Congress, discussions about foreign assistance usually center on the what or the where, or devolve, unfortunately, into partisan fights about whether we should fund foreign assistance at all. In part, that's because of politics. But the lack of investment in new innovative programs has also left our foreign assistance ecosystem vulnerable to waste, program obsolescence, and other issues that undermine domestic support for aid initiatives. USAID is an under-resourced agency that, like any bureaucracy, tends to do what it already knows how to do. The thinking is that new initiatives are risky, and in a political climate that's already hostile to foreign assistance, USAID can't afford to take risks. In my view, that's the opposite of how we should be looking at this. Continuing to do things as they've been done, without change and adaptation, is risky, even if we don't think of it as risk. Thankfully, administrator power has shown a serious commitment to addressing these issues. And when I first got to Congress, Administrator Raj Shaw was also thinking about the very same questions. Back then, I worked with Administrator Shaw to introduce the Global Development Lab Act, legislation that would have codified an office at USAID that looks at how the agency could be more innovative in its development programs. I supported programs like development innovation ventures that were housed at the lab. And when the Trump administration's first budget zeroed out the DIV program, I directly intervened. I worked with a bipartisan coalition, including the now chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, Michael McCall, to make the case that DIV is too valuable to cut. We managed to keep DIV funded through the years. In fact, over the last two years, we were able to almost double the funding DIV receives from Congress. And last month, as Connor mentioned, to build on that work, 
Congresswoman Young Kim and I introduced the Fostering Innovation in Global Development Act, or FIGDA. DIV has demonstrated that USAID is very good at identifying highly effective approaches to foreign assistance, but the agency has struggled to create a pipeline for those innovations to reach the rest of USAID. FIGDA is our answer to that challenge. The bill has many important provisions, and I want to highlight just a few of them. First and foremost, FIGDA formalizes the responsibilities for promoting innovation at USAID by doing some of the following things. Establishing the position of a chief innovation officer who will be chiefly responsible for advancing innovation at USAID. Requiring each USAID bureau to have a senior advisor responsible for innovation. And authorizing the administrator to hire up to 30 innovation fellows who will work across the agency to improve the integration of, to improve the integration of these programs. The bill calls on USAID to identify highly effective evidence-based approaches to foreign assistance and directs all of USAID to proactively consider how they can integrate those approaches into all of their work. To leverage the power of our global allies, FIGDA would further authorize the U.S. to participate in the Global Innovation Fund, a partnership that allows the United States and other governments and donors to pool our resources to support new approaches to the delivery of foreign assistance. And finally, because no agency needs an unfunded mandate, FIGDA would authorize $45 million annually over five years to put innovation at the heart of USAID's work. Earlier this year, we held a launch event on Capitol Hill for FIGDA and heard directly from the One Acre Fund and other groups with evidence-based approaches to aid that could expand if FIGDA becomes law. I'm excited about the broad coalition that we've assembled, and I'm hopeful that FIGDA will be able to move through Congress this year. Sid Ravashankar, Geneva Cropper, and the rest of my team that work on foreign affairs are working incredibly hard daily to make this happen. In a few minutes, you're going to hear from Alex from the Global Innovation Fund and Colin from One Acre Fund, who will speak in further depth about the impact of FIGDA for their respective organizations and the broader landscape for aid. My team and I work closely with Alex, Colin, and Connor in shaping uh, our oversight agenda last Congress and their input, I want you to know, was invaluable as we crafted this legislation. As CSIS and others in this room continue to engage with these critical issues, please know that my office is always interested in leveraging your expertise and learning from your experience. I'm looking forward to continuing these conversations in the days and months ahead. And most of all, thank you all so much for joining today's discussion, and please enjoy the panel. Thank you. So if the uh, panelists want to come up, we'll get started. Thank you, Congressman Castro. We really appreciate that. Good luck with getting FIGDA passed in this Congress. Thank you. So uh, Alex and Colin and Sasha, if you could come up. So thanks again for everyone joining us here today. I've got a great panel to talk a little bit more about innovation and global development, where we are right now. Um, and I think the Congressman really framed it up well in that he's, you know, he, he said, our debates often revolve around the what and the where of foreign aid, and, and often how much, and not really the how and how we're doing it, and what we're, I think, what we're seeking to actually do with the assistance and the instruments and that sort of thing. And innovation ultimately really is about um, improving the way in which we're doing it and trying to drive toward better outcomes and better results. Um, so I'm joined today by Alex Wane, the CEO of the Global Innovation Fund, Sasha Gallant, who's the Division Chief for uh, Development Innovation Ventures at USAID, and Colin Christensen, who's the Global Policy Director um, at the One Acre Fund. Um, three people who I think can have a wonderful conversation with me on this issue of innovation. So to start, um, I, I make the case, I'd like all of you to sort of make the case for innovation and global development. Why should we care about innovative approaches or, or providing funding to innovation, um, especially in what is, as the Congressman pointed out, is often a resource-strapped uh, agency, a resource-strapped sector. So Alex, maybe I'll start with you and then go to Sasha and Colin. So Alex, please, over to you. Oh, 
Great, thank you, and you know, great to be here with both of you, and nice to be here with all of you who are in the room here today. Um, yeah, I'm Alex Wane from the Global Innovation Fund, which, as the congressman helpfully described, is a multilateral investment vehicle to accelerate innovation for international development. And I think the North Star for us at GIF around the role of innovation and development is very much that um, this is a sector in which risk-taking is difficult and uh, the sense of failure is difficult and so we we often say we learn lessons where we do pilots that never fail and never scale and we really do need a space in which you can actually double down on things that work and stop doing things that don't and so we need to think about uh, governance modalities that allow us to do that. So, you know, I'll give you an example from the GIF uh, world that I think really highlights why we need to think about innovation and development. All of us who work in this sector know that domestic resource mobilization is incredibly important for escaping that middle income trap and getting a country like uh, Indonesia to be as wealthy as a country like Thailand. They need to increase their tax revenue. Now, we sort of have lots of ways that you, we did that that are uh, increased enforcement, increased uh, penalties, and changing behavioral norms through brute force and regulation. But, you know, GIF's invested in a company called Online Pajak that actually says, you know what? You can take the lessons from products like Quicken in the US that help individuals pay their taxes really easily and market that to small and medium-sized enterprises in Indonesia so that they can formalize more rapidly and at a lower cost. And that's the kind of thing that we're looking for to say, we know the kind of outcome goals we want that allow for inclusive growth. Let's think about different ways to do that. That's great, Alex. Thanks. Sasha, over to you. Yeah, great. Um, Sasha Gallant, I lead DIB, or Development Innovation Ventures at USAID. Thanks for having us here today. Great to be here with you. Um, I mean, from the Green Revolution, right, to pediatric deworming, to really targeting teaching to the right level, we've seen innovation have a huge demonstrable impact in, in people's lives. And particularly as we're thinking about the next challenges, like responding to climate change, we're going to need innovation to be central to that if we're actually going to succeed. Uh, historically, we've seen private capital play an important role right, in driving innovation. Commercial institutions, as well as incentives, they're not going anywhere, and we don't want them to. But those incentives to invest can really fall short of social need. Um, there are many important cases right, where commercial incentives for innovations are often far less than the social benefits that they actually generate. And in those resulting investment gaps, we see the needs of the poor too often going unaddressed. And so when the returns to an innovation are primarily social in nature, we think governments in particular have a key role to play. Uh, we know there's tremendous potential for public investment in critical areas of innovation, uh, integrating research and experimentation into our broader innovation processes and really learning from that work along the way to improve service delivery and cost effectiveness. Uh, USAID has a strong track record of investing in innovation and in development. Um, I'm glad to be here to speak about DIV, which is uh, USAID's tiered evidence-based open innovation fund that really offers kind of flexible grants to test new ideas, build evidence of what works, and, and scale breakthrough solutions. Um, we've been operating since 2010, and the hypothesis behind the fund I think it's pretty straightforward, right? In general, um, USAID has a strategy that frames which issues and geographic areas we fund, and strategies are critical. They have to focus an organization on a, a key set of priorities. They inform everything from where we spend our money to the kind of people we hire, and uh, different USAID priorities have resulted in really big investments in important domains from like PEPFAR to early literacy to pandemic preparedness. But, some important things inevitably fall between the cracks of any organization strategy, right? And by holding exclusively to one set process, right, to achieve that strategy, we risk missing great ideas. And we risk the opportunity to really engage with new and different and, and non-traditional and excellent partners. Uh, so turning the core approach around a bit, Div's built on the idea that good ideas can come from anyone. 
anywhere at any time, right? We solicit applications through an open window. We accept applications year round from innovators and researchers working across every sector and every geography in which USAID operates. And we define innovation really broadly to include anything that enables more value, specifically more social value to be created with fewer resources. Uh, we're open to innovation scaling through any pathway and we're really thinking about broad sense of partners. And I think what we found at DIV is that investing in innovation generates a tremendous return on investment um, and has led to the integration of some of the most kind of promising interventions into broader work across the agency. So I'm sure we can dive into deeper weeds later on, but you know, top line results looking at DIV are that its early portfolio has generated a social return of $17 for every $1 invested by the US taxpayer. And so I, I think like the, the top line takeaway is that this works. Right. Yeah. No, I think that's great. Thank you, Sasha. And Colin, over to you. Yeah, I think to just build on that, I mean, the, the kind of great innovations that the Global Innovation Fund and DIV have promoted, this idea of needing to be more efficient with the dollars that we have, um, more impact focused. I think to take a step back, the reason that's so critical is that the world is in a really tough spot, right? We are, we are, we are, we are going through some tough times that are going to get worse. I encourage everyone, if you haven't, to just skim the, the UN's um, SDG report from, from last year that paints a pretty harrowing picture, right? They talk about being in grave jeopardy of missing our 2030 SDG targets. Um, and this is because of the interlocking crises that we see. Um, I mean, just looking, so One Acre Fund, we, we, we work with smallholder farmers, and just looking at SDG 2, the goal of you know, ending hunger, We've actually seen over COVID the number of hunger people, uh, hungry people in the world increase by 150 million people to upwards of 800 million people in the world are hungry. So we're in, in grave danger of missing that goal. And I don't see how we get closer to that if we don't focus on innovation. Um, you know, the Ukraine, the, the war in Ukraine, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has added strain to that, to that goal, right? And the era of great power conflict you know, God forbid, we, we might face more of those kind of, of crises. And, and climate change. Um, it is really hard to overstate how devastating climate change will be to smallholder farmers. So these are most of the farmers in the world, hundreds of millions of farmers in the world, right, that grow most of the food in the world, rely on just a few acres of land, largely rely on, you know, rain-fed agriculture. So a changing, you know, a changing climate really affects them. So, so thinking about how do we serve the you know, farmers and, and other vulnerable populations differently through innovation is absolutely critical. So in the case of farmers, how do we make sure they can access precision agriculture tools, right, that help them be much more, you know, much more efficient in how they plant? Um, and it's not only technology. How do we make sure they have access to innovative insurance products? so we can actually de-risk their decisions, right? Or how do we make sure they have access to new crop varieties so they can, you know, more, you know, drought, you know, drought, drought, drought tolerant crops. You know, these are the kind of innovations we need. And if we don't get these to the most vulnerable populations through mechanisms like my colleagues here are, are promoting, um, I think, you know, many people are gonna suffer even more in the coming decades. You know, just building on yeah. what Sasha was saying about, and what Colin's saying there about, the need for you know why spend taxpayer resources on these kind of things. You know, Colin, you've made a great point about the need for improved seed varieties for farmers in Africa. It's almost certainly not the case that the private sector is going to choose the optimal level of investment in that because that's not um, where you know the, there's large amounts of profits to be made, and so it, that is the, exactly yes. the intersection mm -hmm. where directly through the agency or through multilateral vehicles right. like GIF, we can supplement too low a level of private investment to meet those development yeah. goals that Colin's so eloquently yeah. describing. Alex, let me, let me take that. I think that's an excellent point, so let me push you a little bit on that or just use this as an opportunity. What you're really talking about in some, is a market failure, essentially, mm -hmm. either by government in some instances or by the private sector. Tell us. Where does GIF kind of fit themselves into that, and how are you trying to kind of address that market, what you see as a market failure? Yeah, thanks very much. It is very much building on that point. Yeah. So let's. So you have this generalized market failure of too little private investment in R and D, and that's true in the U.S. as well. There's a reason why we have lots of other government programs to accelerate innovation here domestically, but internationally, it's particularly acute precisely because the target market for many of these innovations are people with relatively low ability to pay. 
And so you can, you can go about that through you know, supporting additional public sector investment, or you can figure out, and this is in some ways a, a challenging problem, how to nudge uh, additional private sector investment into scaling up. And that's really partly what GIF does. Um, similar to DIV, we do grant making based on evidence of impact. But uniquely in the development space, we also do early stage debt and equity investing. So a little bit like venture capital style investing, but with social returns really at the forefront of what we do. So you know, uh, let's think about those farmers that call that Colin and One Acre Fund serve. Um, they they operate in a world in which there's relatively little credit available. Capital markets are very shallow compared to here in the U.S. And innovators who might have great ideas about new products or services for those smallholder farmers often have a challenge accessing capital. So one of the things that we do as GIF is try to come in to de-risk innovations that might be able to serve those kinds of target markets. So we'll, we'll give you an example there. Colin, you mentioned insurance as a challenge for smallholder farmers. And that's certainly true. Many insurance products are actually not that great and people don't really want to buy them. So one of the things we did last year as part of our Innovating for Climate Resilience Fund is we've actually taken an equity position in a company that sells insurance products to big corporates who buy products from smallholder farmers. So think about Starbucks, who's buying uh, coffee from smallholder farmers in Rwanda. Rather than try and market insurance to each of those smallholders, Starbucks can sort of buy an insurance product that's bundled and then provide those services to people, um, rather than each individual farmer needing to make a choice there. We're really keen to see if this could work, and if it can, then we want to crowd in other capital after we de-risk this rather than crowd it out. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really the uh, complementary piece that GIF plays. Um, and if you know we're doing things right, innovations might graduate from DIV to GIF to the USDFC and other DFIs. And we can really think about joining up this innovation ecosystem for the private sector. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Let me go to you, Sasha, for a minute. So as we're thinking about AIDS role in this and Div's role in this, you know, one of the questions I wanted to go to you is how do you kind of take this beyond just Div at the agency in particular? And certainly thinking about the ecosystem that that Alex just referenced, but how do you kind of get this out throughout the agency to kind of affect some of the change that you were referencing in your earlier remarks? Yeah, absolutely. So I guess I want to take a step back first to say innovation takes place across the yeah. agency, right? It always has. It's in our innovation division, absolutely, in which it sits, but it's also in bureaus, like mm -hmm. the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance or for Resilience and Food Security, and, and it's in our missions around the world. I think our challenge has been to capture it, to learn from it, and to scale it. Yeah. Um, and innovation is, you know, and, I, and we can talk about this later, often happening a bit in silos, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I think this is one of the reasons that the agency has created the Office of the Chief Economist and that they're working further to enable the work of the Chief Innovation Officer and all the work kind of under that, that general space, right? The beauty of this conversation right now is that um, this is what we're trying to fix as we speak, right? Mm -hmm. We're leading efforts and kind of better coordination and my colleagues in this room right now, right? Around all the innovation corners of the agency to ensure that, that what we're learning in our innovation processes influences our programming and our budgets and that the best interventions and innovations we're finding and testing can then find a path to scale. Uh, this is hard work especially in an agency that is quite reasonably and justifiably highly decentralized. Mm -hmm. uh, it requires giving agency colleagues like the tools and the times and, and the time, excuse me, and, and frankly, the incentives to try something a little bit different. Uh, and it also requires having counterparts within USAID who can help our colleagues all across the agency break down the evidence and understand not just what works, but why and where it might again, and also what we should stop doing along the way, right? So I think innovation has, I just wanna reinforce, right? It's always been part of our work at USAID, but we're putting a really concerted effort now toward kind of better linking up, exactly as you said, like this, these core R&D functions of sorts of the agency 
uh, and the at scale programming of our broader operations. And this means really building out, as the congressman spoke to as well, an, an innovation pipeline, right? Codifying these effective innovation programs like DIV as well as others across AID and working with partners really focused on innovation and evidence to create frameworks that help us really know and identify kind of smart buys, what really works, uh, and then figuring out how best to improve that knowledge transfer and program design such that they can really see paths to scale across the agency. But it's not a one-off effort mm -hmm. in one part of the agency, yeah. right? This is kind of a broader uptake about not just opening the door to USAID, which I think we've, we've effectively done and are continuing to find different ways to do, but figuring out where does that door lead? That's great. Thanks, Sasha. Colin, let me come back to you for the, a minute on this, on your model, on One Acre Funds model. I'd really like you to sort of unpack how you're trying to get at some of the different things, because it's not just what you're providing that are innovations, it's the model in general, that One Acre Fund. And you are also, I should say, you're a recipient of funding from both DIV and GIF. Definitely. <laughs> so you're, thank you. So this is a good opportunity to show your value. But no, tell, because I think your model is very interesting beyond just what you're actually trying to provide from an input perspective. Yeah, and I think it kind of builds on what Sasha was just talking about, which is just the breadth of what innovation means and how many people are involved. And you know, I guess, and, you know, partly just if there's one thing I hope everyone takes away from this webinar, it's again, innovation is not just like sexy technology, yeah. right? Yes. Innovation really is about this idea of how do you become more efficient with the dollars you spend for more impact. And to the broad range of things that Sasha just talked about and clearly that GIF is investing in, I think that is just the key point here is it is a, there's so many ways of thinking about innovation. So in the One Acre Fund, you know, in, in our way of thinking about innovation, it really is just our model, right? It's our model of service delivery. Um, so firstly, it starts with the fact that we're, we're a social enterprise. So we're a nonprofit, but we work like a business. So we, so we engage with farmers, you know, they, they are clients of ours. They're paying for services. They're paying market price for services, right? Um, and that just gives us from the start a very different relationship with clients than a typical like NGO has because we have to convince them to buy our services. So that's the sort of starting point of, of how we're innovative. I think the second thing is we've, we really address a number of market <coughs> failings at the same time. And I think Alex sort of you know, teed this up nicely that you know, you know, all vulnerable communities, especially smallholder farmers in very rural areas, they just face a cascading number of, of market failings that really keep them in poverty. So if you're a smallholder farmer, you don't have enough cash at planting to buy fertilizer and seed, right? Because you, know, you, you, you don't have a predictable cash flow. So providing the financing for, for, for them to buy the fertilizer and seed is critical. But microfinance isn't sufficient because if you can't just give them cash, because if you're in rural Burundi, you can't find high quality fertilizer and seed. So you also have to solve the distribution problem. So we provide both the financing, but we're also just a major logistical operation. I mean, we're moving tens of thousands of metric tons of fertilizer and seed around East and Southern Africa every season, right? But even that's not sufficient, right? Because if you don't train farmers on how to maximize that return on the investment, on how to microdose fertilizer, on how to not broadcast seeds, on how to actually plant seeds in rows, they can actually lose money on that investment. So, you know, part of our innovation is just a massive rural infrastructure of field staff, and we have 9,000 staff who are giving weekly trainings to farmers on how to maximize that return on investment. And then finally, you have to help farmers, you know, maximize what they get out of their harvest at the end. So even though our farmers eat 70% of what they grow, you have to help farmers store that after harvest to make sure it's not wasted, and you have to help connect them to markets for what they are going to sell. And you have to do all of that together. And so I know it doesn't sound that you know, innovative, but really the innovation when like Andrew, our, our founder, started One Acre Fund 15 years ago was to just figure out that you have to do all of that together. Mm -hmm. And then the other part of the innovation is that you, know, you have to then leverage blended finance. So we, we, we take, you know, we take a very, um, we have a very diverse set of revenue, right? So I mentioned that farmers pay for our services, they cover about 70% of our operating costs, but to serve the poorest farmers and to do things like invest in, in, in the right crop varieties for those farmers, you do need that donor support. Otherwise, those poorest farmers are just gonna be ignored. 
And so we, we, do, we do leverage grant money, right? But we also leverage uh, concessional debt. Alex mentioned the DFC. We've gotten $40 million of loans from the DFC. They've been a phenomenal partner with us. And we leverage those loans to basically as working capital because we have to buy all that fertilizer and seed up front before farmers repay. So I think that all of that makes for very complex you know, infrastructure. And so to sort of focus on building that over the last 15 years, which now allows us to serve about 3.2 million farmers, um, is, is I think really kind of how we approach innovation. So The other thing I'd call. say about yeah. One Acre Fund that I think is really instructive for all of us thinking about funding innovation is that they've invested in really credible measurement of impact and monitoring yeah. of the impact that they can deliver. And that's really critical because, precisely because of the blended finance model. If you want concessional debt, if you want grant finance, then the donors quite reasonably should be saying, well, what's the social return on my that's investment? Exactly, yeah. And One Acre Fund is really best in class about being able to provide you the kind of data that allows you to say, I can explain very clearly why this subsidy or concessional finance makes sense from a social perspective. And I think all of us in this space should be thinking more about how can we learn from that and have that not be more common throughout yeah. um, the space. Let's actually stick with the evidence base for a second because I think this is actually a really important piece of both what DIV and GIF does sure. and the folks you support because I think, you know, Sasha, you referenced that sort of early Early evidence suggests that you're getting about $17 of a social return for every dollar that you're investing. And I know GIF has done a similar exercise. Of course, David Kramer won the Nobel Prize along with some other folks for some of the work that, that has led to DIV and, and other parts of this. Tell, give us, give us a, what is the evidence base here? What does it say? Sasha, why don't I start with you? And then Alex, I want to hear from you on GIF. So yeah. Sasha, go we ahead. Can, we're getting wonky, so we can just Yeah, let's just go. Let's That's just keep fine. it as wonky yeah. as possible. That's fine. Going to, to it's a think tank, yeah. Sasha. <laughs> this is what we do best. It's great. So the public sector, right, which I keep talking about kind of this general space, the, the public sector has always played a critical role in really pushing forward R&D. And there is evidence of high returns in the space, right? I mean, I think some of the estimates for public R&D investments in science, we're looking at in the US specifically, yeah. had an annual social rate of return of 55%. But there's been a lot less evidence that's been generated over, over time on the high level returns to social science, to experimental methods in the social sciences, and to social entrepreneurship, right? There's an anecdotes of success for sure, but there's also plenty of anecdotes of failure that go alongside that. And so the, the work that we've done here on Div and elsewhere, I think can really add to the success narrative and, and quite vigorously, frankly. Um, what we found is that social innovation funds like Div are highly cost efficient tools um, for identifying, testing, and rapidly scaling um, some of the best innovations like your work. Uh, failure happens quickly and cheaply, and it's also premised on evidence, right? And so we, we try to actually do, we do have those pilots that may in fact fail along the way, and that's the point, right? Is that we, we make sure that we're throwing, we're, we're putting good money after good and not good money after bad. Um, we also learn from our successes. And Div has supported kind of really a remarkable range of investments that have have directly led or contributed to the, the realization of significant innovation. We've seen that, in, you know, to name a few, right? Key investments from DIV contributed to an evidence base uh, that has underpinned millions of dollars of public and private investment in digital agriculture. Um, the endpoint of which, at least so far, has contributed to productivity improvements for millions of farmers um, and boosted the caloric intake of the families depending on them. Uh, our investments in, in eyewear to combat um, presbyopia, right, which is this age-related, mostly age-related loss of eyesight, has extended not just the productive working lives, but also the dignity of, of millions of people, right, across South Asia and Africa. Um, early investments in DIV, by DIV in Demagi and their work in ComCare, this customizable digital solution for, for coordinating and recording the activities of social sector workers has been used by over a million frontline workers around the world, right? We see real kind of cost and efficiency gains. And of course, we've been tremendously proud of, and just to be a small part of the work that One Acre Fund has done, which I think over the course of the Div Award, but 
check me on this if I'm wrong, it improved farmer incomes in Uganda and Malawi by nearly 20%, and I crossed your network by 44%. I mean, these are tremendous gains. And just to break on this, sorry, really briefly, I think it's absolutely the work that you know, right, of like measuring impact in a place like a one acre fund, but it's also having these deep learning tools and, and frameworks within an organization that doesn't just take what was built 15 years ago and run with it, right? It's this continued optimization and learning that allows for these kinds of gains and, and the value for these kinds of continued investments. So these project level successes are you know, super exciting. We could talk about them all day. Uh, we're 277 investments and we're you know, a lot of them there. But uh, if we wanna make a case for supporting innovation, right? And these kinds of innovation models, then we have to look at the portfolio level outcomes. And this we've done. So in an analysis that um, was led by Michael Kramer, uh, just been in Michael this Kramer, yes, I always sorry. say David Kramer. He's a Cold War historian, <laughs> two different say. people. Okay. Why did I say David? Go it's ahead. Very well mind. Different, different uh, Kramer. Different Kramer, yeah. <laughs> so we looked at Div's early portfolio in order to address kind of a few important questions, right? What, innovation, what innovations actually scale? Um, what lessons are there for the design of social innovation funds? And I think at our core, right, is social innovation just a good investment yeah. overall? Um, bringing it back to the like DIV origin story, right? When Div started, um, it was designed to take a portfolio approach to impact in the same spirit as venture capital, right? We don't expect every investment to knock it out of the park, but we expect that enough of them will that will make up the case of the kind of the whole portfolio. So when Div started over 10 years ago, they, we set a target, USAID set a target of 15% uh, return, social rate of return on investment on the portfolio. In this analysis, we basically get a lower bound estimate on the benefits of, of Div's investments by calculating the benefits of just a few innovations from the early portfolio. And basically, we look at the average benefit per person, which is kind of taken from RCTs. Uh, we then multiply that by the number of people reached, and we adjust specifically for the share of DIV funding to avoid double counting even with other funders, right, to really kind of capture what each dollar has done. And what we found is that the portfolio cost in those early days was $16 million. By the end of 2019, DIV's investments in just five innovations had already generated an estimated $261 million in discounted social benefits. Mm -hmm. What this means is that in just the first couple of years of investment, we can conservatively estimate, and this is really a taking a very conservative approach, mm -hmm. that each dollar invested through the fund generated $17 in social returns, right, which corresponds to a social rate of return of over 140%. I mean, these are remarkable results when you're thinking about innovation, and I think a very welcome return on, on the USG investment, as well as just a, a kind of a welcome narrative in this space to be able to, to see what these kinds of yeah. funds are able to do. Yeah. yeah, no, that's great. Alex, please, impact. How are you thinking about it at GIF, and how are you measuring measuring the, the, the impact of your investments. Yeah, so I, I do think the headline thing here is that innovation pays. And um, we've done similar calculations as those that Sasha has described, and without going into those details too much, you know, GIF is on track to, broadly speaking, be improving the lives of something like 140 million people a year over the next five to 10 years. Um, and um, if you do a calculation such as is done by the charity evaluator GiveWell, you know, uh, roughly speaking, GIF is generating three times as much social value um, already as relative to if you'd spent the same amount of money on bed net distribution. So yeah, innovation pays. And, but just stepping back a little bit, I think there's a couple of things here that it's interesting for us to reflect on. One is, you know, lots of times in the public sector, we fund innovation through challenge funds. And those are great. And as a former Gates Foundation alumni, you know, challenge funds are part of my, you know, in my blood and part of my bread and butter. But so lots of times after a challenge fund award, innovators can find themselves in a bit of a valley of death, where they're not quite ready for typical commercial funding, mm -hmm. but there aren't easy other sort of windows at USAID or somewhere like that to access additional funding. Um, and you know, 
the DFC and other uh, DFIs like that are also wonderful, quite large pots of money for scaling up innovation, such as done at the One Acre Fund. But their taste and tolerance for the kind of risk that Sasha has been talking about is not always up to the task. So we do have this pioneer gap um, where we need to think about how to fund innovation in that missing middle space. And the ability of DIV to do follow-on funding, the ability of entities like GIF to say, yes, I will be part of not just your Series A funding round, but your bridge to Series B and your Series B round. And yes, we can combine debt and equity together if that's what your firm needs right now. That's that pioneer gap. That's the missing middle. And that's how we scale up innovation and realize the kind of gains that we're talking about here. Now, I've just spoken there about in the private sector how this works, but there's an analog of that for things that are going to scale up through government as well. You know, it's one thing to have an amazing result from a randomized controlled trial, like, wow, cool result. And then there's service delivery at scale. And there's a pioneer gap in between those two things as well. And I think the ability of DIV, or of GIF, to do follow-on funding rounds without needing to go hat in hand to other bureaus or silos within aid mm. agencies mm. is really critical to realizing the potential power of you know, perspective measurements of the benefits yeah, of innovation. Yeah, yeah, that's great, Alex. Colin, let me give you a chance. Just talk about your impact. I'd love to hear, you know, I think this is a good, a good opportunity to kind of understand what you all have achieved with the support from DIV and GIF and other funders. What impact have you seen? How are you measuring your impact? How are you thinking about your impact on the ground? Yeah, and I think. I think to sort of narrow down and get super wonky. Please. <laughs> I think as we've sort of discussed, you know, you know why impact is so important. I, I think, I think helping organizations to measure impact and leveraging leveraging public grant money, especially to do that, can be transformative. And I, I think the One Acre Fund story is really just helpful from an illustrative standpoint, right? And and I think hopefully really helpful for the sector. And I think bills like FIGDA, I think, are really about how do we expand. On, on, I think, some of the lessons that we've learned. So the first is that you know, it does cost money. I mean, we spend millions of dollars a year, right, largely, largely of grant money in building a very robust evaluation structure. And it all centers on basically calculating what we call dollar impact for farmers. So as a social enterprise, this dollar impact number is effectively our equivalent of a profit number, right? It is, it is our North Star. It's what drives all of our business decisions. And we calculate it um, by, by you know, not just taking self-reported data from farmers, we don't just ask farmers how much they're growing, right? We have a massive team of enumerators that goes out every year, we do this annually, and literally weighs the harvests of farmers that are enrolled in one acre fund, and then farmers that are not enrolled in one acre fund, but are similar, so similar characteristics, so we can create a comparison group. And that allows us to create an attributable number. And that's the key thing, right? You need attribution in how you measure impact. You need to know that any improvement you're seeing exists because of your program and not because of some other environmental you know, thing that happened, right? So by doing that, by doing these tens of thousands of crop cuts and investing these millions of dollars, we come up with this really clean dollar impact number. We monetize their harvest, essentially, so we can see you know, how much value we're able to provide to farmers. This is value after they've paid back loans, so just pure profit. So of the farmers that we serve, the sort of million and a half farmers that we serve most, most directly from that, you know, that full model I talked about, um, we're able to give about, in, in 2021, we we're able to, they're, each of them were able to um, achieve about $100 of profit. Now, $100 to us doesn't sound a lot, but again, if you're in rural Rwanda or rural Malawi, that's a lot of money of just pure profit coming from your, um, from, your, from your farm. And if you aggregate this across our entire network, in 2021, we generated, let me just double check this, $215 million of value for farmers. Right? And that, again, it's an incredibly rigorous number. This isn't just some glossy number in an annual report. This is coming from this like, rigorous impact assessment that we do. And this then becomes our North Star. So the first part is we've invested, thanks to support from, from agencies like DIV and GIF, we've invested in this evaluation infrastructure. But then we make decisions because of this, right? So 
we, we, this, this number goes you know, all the way down to field staff. Like field staff can tell you how many dollars of impact were generated in their, in their, in their um, country that in the last year. So firstly, it's just culturally motivating, right? It is the motivating number for, for us as an organization. It's why people are at One Acre Fund. But then we make decisions. So thanks to the DIV investment in Uganda, as an example, we actually pivoted the entire Uganda program to focus more on higher value crops like coffee because in that impact assessment, we made that decision that that's where we were going to see the most impact. Or we pivoted the Zambia program a couple years ago to mostly focus on agroforestry. So we make these massive decisions, mm. not because of what donors are telling us, right, but because of what that impact yeah, number yeah. is telling us. Yeah. So I think that that's where these impact numbers become powerful. And then the other really important thing we can do with that, back to the discussion about blended finance, is you, know, you can think of rigorous impact like a currency. Right? It's a currency that lets you drive resources into your organization from philanthropic markets. Because when people trust your impact number, when they believe that you're actually having the impact that you say in your annual report, then they're more com comfortable in covering whatever deficit you have. So that impact number then becomes a critical fundraising tool for us to help us cover the deficit that allows us to serve the most poor farmers. So, so I think that, that really understanding how that yeah. impact can really become the, the absolute blood of your organization, yeah. I think is critical. No, I think that's right. And I, I want to stick with that theme for just a minute and come to you, uh, to Alex and Sasha on this. So I, I feel like what, one of the things that really comes through in what Colin was just saying is this idea of being able to pivot and to change directions and to respond to what the evidence is saying. And I don't think that when you th talk about traditional assistance, we don't always do that, right? It remains very chicken and beef, as some people like to say. You've got chicken or beef, maybe there's a vegetarian option, but you don't really have a lot of else there. How, do you, how does DIV, how does GIF kind of respond to those outputs from the evidence that you're seeing from groups like One Acre Fund? How do you change or address or work with, the, work with, your, with, your, um, with your investee? How do you respond to that kind of thing. I know I said no, no, no curveballs, but no, yeah, I, want to throw, I want to use this opportunity sure. to throw that out there. Sasha, maybe you and then Alex. Yeah, great, great. So I think, I, I mean, I, I think there's been this narrative, and I feel like this whole panel is countering this, in particular Colin's work, that evidence and innovation somehow are like getting each other's way. Right, that evidence is, it takes too long to generate evidence, that it actually like, it's, it's, we can't spend that much time or this deep of an investment in kind of our learning frameworks because like we gotta move, right? We yeah. gotta run with what we, we think we know and go from there. And I think what this work has shown and certainly our work has shown is that, is that these things are like deeply synergistic, right? And, and that evidence and learning can really enable innovation, um, but it requires deep feedback loops. It requires working with organizations who really want to learn, who take that impact figure seriously, yes, for their donors, but also for their work, right? Yes. That like that's that's why they're there and what they're trying to do. And there may also, and we uh, Div invests in commercial entities regularly, right? Mm -hmm. The two organizations who have received all three stages of DIV funding are commercial entities, but they are they are uh, companies who are deeply invested, who are again like socially oriented and thinking about serving. Um, people who are in like lower quintiles, uh, economic quintiles, and, and the question there is both, you know, how is there kind of an economic gain uh, for the company, but also how are you really creating kind of productivity or different kinds of gains for your customer? Um, the way that Div designs our awards is actually designed for iteration, right? We expect um, that what we see at the end of the award is going to look very different than the grant summary we wrote up in the beginning. Um, ultimately, we almost write that grant summary with our grantee to say, you know, what did we, what did we, how did we think we were going to get there? Because it's less about how we're going to get there and more about like what are we actually here mm -hmm. to achieve. And so the way that we draft milestones, which again, these are not cost reimbursable awards like so many are, but instead thinking about what do you need to, to demonstrate? What are the outcomes, the different kinds of performance metrics along the way that are gonna help an organization know that they're on track to achieving the ultimate goal of reaching X million farmers, right? And improving uh, yield by Y percent, whatever that is, right? And so we have kind of hard targets in those milestones, but what we don't have are kind of unnecessary additional activities. We're not paying to see every you know person in every mm -hmm. seat in every mm -hmm. training. What we want to know is that an organization like One Acre Fund is um, learning and shifting and growing and making the changes they need to in order to stay on course. And so 
well, you know, certainly the vast majority of these awards actually do achieve what was set out in the beginning, but the path there is always a little bit different yeah. than the beginning. Uh, and I think being able to work as a partner, uh, trying to achieve those outcomes for people, as opposed to kind of the, just the activity designer yeah. up front, allows for that yeah. space. Colin, yeah. can I just, yeah, yeah, just go add that? Because we benefited from a $5 million Div Award to expand in Malawi and, and Uganda, and that was exactly why we loved working with Div. So it's often hard to fit that model that we have into sort of our round model into the square peg of a typical USAID RFP, which are very complicated and very activity-based. Yes. But what Div allowed us to do is just report back on that impact number that I told you about, our scale number, and what we call sustainability, which is how much, how much are we getting from farmers versus donors. And that's all, you, I mean, that's all you required of us. And you gave us all this flexibility to, to adapt our programs as long as we you know, were accountable to those metrics. And you held us accountable to them. We had to report on those and we had to meet the targets we had set, but you didn't micromanage us. You allowed us to innovate and change on the ground. Yeah. And I just, you know, so I just wanted to give that as an example of exactly what you, yeah. what you yeah. just said. Yeah. Yeah. The last thing I'd say, sorry, it's just like, we sit in a donor institution. I'm not, I've been an implementer before, but right now that's not the job, right? Yeah. You're the implementing organization. And I think the confidence is that we do our diligence up front to know that we're working with really solid organizations mm -hmm. who can do this work and we calibrate funding mm -hmm. accordingly based on yeah. what we know. And then there is a trust-based relationship as well as these checks along the way. But my expectation is that you know better than I do how to serve smallholder farmers, right? And so the question is like, how do yeah. we build that, that conversation along the way to enable that as best as we can from where we sit? Alex, I want to give you a chance to respond to this. So, you know, how are you reacting to the evidence you're seeing and how are you pivoting or, or responding to what you're seeing from your investees? Yeah, I guess, the, you know, one metric I think maybe we should bring into the field here in thinking about this is a leverage mm -hmm. number. And, you know, certainly I think a way to think about holding GIF accountable for whether it as an entity is pivoting appropriately is how much new capital are we bringing in? Mm -hmm. You know, Colin started off our conversation here about talking about sort of overlapping crises in the world and over competing demands um, for very scarce um, aid dollars. And you know, one of the things that we at GIF are held accountable for is how much additional capital are we crowding in? Um, and that helps us to pivot. Um, and so we, you know, in our most recent calculations on this, we think for every dollar we've invested, we've crowded in something like $7 of other new capital. And you know, that's the kind of thing that collectively all of us would like to see really scaled mm -hmm. up if we are yeah. going to achieve or get back on track towards achieving the SDGs. There's just no world in which you know, traditional aid finance is going to be how we achieve those kinds of goals. Yeah. And so we really do think about pivoting in that direction, and it gets you really interesting things to think about. So uh, we invested in a company in, in our early days that was trying to figure out how to market pay-as-you-go liquefied natural gas to households in uh, low-income urban areas in East Africa. And this you know, helps people transition to uh, safer, cleaner fuel mm -hmm. sources. Mm -hmm. Now, this company actually um, struggled themselves to achieve scale, but they were then acquired by a different company who already work at massive scale throughout East Africa. So did we make money on that individual investment that we made? Not that much. Do we have a credible story to say, here's how that crowded in lots of other money to achieve much larger impact yeah. at scale from a small investment made by GIF? Yes. It's just a different way of looking at the world, of thinking about we're trying to maximize this social value. Uh, profitability is a means to the end of scale, but it's not the end in and of itself. Yeah. And so that really helps GIF pivot. Let's um, stick with scale for just a moment because it's pathways to scales come up a little bit uh, throughout this conversation. I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about how GIF looks at this, this approach, how you scale, how are we gonna scale innovation? Yeah. I think you gave a really good example of how you can via commercial means, but how, are, how else are, can we get to scale? What do we need to get to scale? And I'd say, Sasha, I'd love to hear from your perspective at AID on this question of scale as well and how you're thinking about it. Yeah, some of it, so I'm a, a challenge I think I'd give those of us working in aid agency spaces is to think about 
uh, pools of flexible capital. Um, so I'll give an example there of where a small amount of money from GIF made a very big difference in reaching scale. Um, oh, we uh, had backed a company in India at, through a grant, actually, to figure out how to scale up a tablet-based um, tool for helping kids um, catch up in Hindi and math learning, a company called Education Initiatives, who I think you know well, yeah, Colin. Yes. And they originally, this was a partnership between this company and the government of the state of Rajasthan to figure out how to introduce this product into government schools. And um, there was a nice sort of three-way arrangement where the government was paying for some of the hardware associated with this. As this went on, and there seemed to be traction in the state of Rajasthan, other states in India also became interested in adopting this product. And what, what quickly became apparent was that there were going to be lots of challenges in procurement because they would have to procure not just hardware, relatively easy to write an RFP for, but software as a service, mm -hmm. much more complicated to write that contract. GIF was able to give just a small amount of money to a consulting company who, at federal level, helped develop sort of best practice guidance for procuring software as a service that then all the states who wanted to be involved in this could uh, use as guidance. I don't know, a few hundred thousand dollars. But oftentimes, it's surprisingly difficult to come up with a few hundred thousand dollars yes. pretty quickly to do something small and discreet like that. Especially for something not as sexy as procurement. Procurement yeah. is not one of those things <laughs> yeah. where we want to spend and so, money on. So, right, you know, that's a great example but it's a good of enabler. small amount of money mm -hmm. unlocked quite a lot of yeah. scale. Yeah. And so I think a yeah. good challenge yeah. for us is we need to have a little bit more of sometimes those kinds of pots of yeah. money if we yeah. want to achieve yeah. these, these uh, potential. Yeah, I always do love that example. It's a great example for what we can do here. Sasha, talk about Pathways to Scale and how you're yeah, thinking about sure. it. So USAID has a number of ongoing efforts, right, mm -hmm. of thinking about um, how to scale innovation and really provide increased value for money when doing that kind of across the agency, right? And so that includes supporting DIVs, new scale-up initiatives, kind of expanding the use of things like larger innovation incentive awards, which are really valuable to missions across, across the agency, um, seeing the work of our innovation labs across AID, and certainly embedding the work of the new office of the chief economist under Dean Carlin, really to support the broader generation and use of that evidence across the agency. Um, Div recently received funding from Open Philanthropy to support mm -hmm. our work in scaling proven innovation specifically across USAID, right? And this scale-up work, I think, aligns closely with some of the conversation around this like proven solutions program. Uh, and we're finding that missions and bureaus are deeply interested in this work, right? Our team, and supported by the Chief Innovation Officer and in collaboration with the Office of the Chief Economist and others, are, are really working to kind of better coordinate this evidence-driven innovation work in order to drive it across the agency. In terms of how to do even more, I think like, learning from innovation, again, bringing it back to this, and really building off of that evidence is, is critical. And thinking about this in a place like USAID, this is about assessing relevance to local context, right? Figuring out how to adapt something that was effective in one place and make those pivots in Zambia or make those pivots in Uganda or elsewhere. Um, within USAID, it's a need that we're seeing, and certainly with the creation of, of the Office of Chief Economist, which is certainly receiving a fair amount of demand um, for missions and elsewhere, uh, in terms of thinking about what is the evidence? How do we apply it? And then also, how do we generate evidence along mm -hmm. the way in order to make sure that we're learning from our larger programs as well? Uh, so I think part of this is about making concerted efforts, not just to invest in innovation, but to learning from our work along the way. And that's really critical for scale. And it goes back to the one, point, one of the points you made, where great that you have an excellent RCT, but if we don't know what it means to implement that, yeah. uh, then it sits in a journal and it doesn't actually influence yeah. the world. Yeah. And so. I think one other thing that we're, we're thinking about deeply is partnerships, and you've spoken about this a lot, right? The idea of, of who do we need to work with? Where is there other kinds mm. of leverage to be able to bring in? Um, and that certainly means working with the DFC extensively, sometimes in our diligence, yeah. right? To yeah. say, you know, what does it actually mean to set this up for the next investment? Uh, we do that with external investors, right? Some of our largest investments, our earliest stage three was for a $5 million award that leveraged $95 million dollars from external investments but the idea was really to come in and prove how to market yeah. for early off-grid electric kind of opportunities yeah. and and think about how that moves to scale but i think part of this is is thinking about scale from the start mm -hmm. uh, and making sure that we're we're not a forever funder 
GF is not a forever funder. That's not the point, right? Is that, I mean, perhaps on the equity and debt side, but in terms of thinking about grant funding, we're usually a one-off, maybe two, maximum three times kind of funder that somebody can come to. And so the idea is how do we use this award, not just to generate evidence, though certainly that, but to work on kind of the core operations that will enable scalability. And how do we work with those partners who we think are actually going to bring this intervention yeah. to scale from the start to help design an award that will set this up for the next phase investment from us. Thank you. Yeah. So we're almost we're almost at time, but Colin, I do want to give you a chance for a final reflection. Perhaps on the scale issue, as you're kind of thinking about it at the country level, how are you, how's One Acre Fund approaching this issue of scale? Um, you've obviously scaled tremendously already, um, how do you go to the next step? <laughs> I guess like why, why does scale matter? Yeah. I guess that's the question, yeah. right? I mean, we throw this term around and I think back to the, you know, the SDG question, it matters because like you don't meet the SDGs unless you amplify all our impact, you know, a thousand, tens of 10,000 fold, right? There are many, many people in this world who are suffering greatly. Right? And we cannot be happy if we just serve a small fraction of them. And we will not meet our global commitments if we only serve a fraction of them. So scale is ultimately important because of the, the size of the development challenge we face. So like in agriculture, I mean, just, even just smallholder agriculture in Africa, specific to the sort of farmers that we can serve, there's like a market of 55 million smallholder farmers that we've identified that could potentially benefit from this model that we've developed. So A, how do we think about scale? In addition to how much impact we're delivering, we want to serve as many of those farmers as possible because of the enormity of the challenge and the, and the, the need that they each have, right? Um, but we also recognize like we can't do it alone, right? I mean, there's only so many, like we're not expecting to serve 55 million farmers, right? Um, and, and sustainably serve, which is the other big thing, is you have to serve them not just for a five-year you know, grant cycle, you have to serve them for decades. So I think, you know, what I'm most excited about with FIGDA is this is actually the proven solution section of FIGDA, where it's not only about the creation of innovation, but it is about how do you scale proven solutions. And I think, you know, in the case of, of the One Acre Fund model, there are lots of other, or, or I wish there were lots, there are other social enterprises, I hope eventually lots of social enterprises like us. So Miagro, which does similar work in West Africa, right? Excesso, which does similar work to us in, in Central America and Haiti. I, I think. I think how do we get you know, more organizations into the space to solve the problem? And then those organizations that are in the space, how do you, you know, not just be satisfied with them you know, serving a small number, but actually expect them to serve a large number, I think is critical to us solving this development problem, right? It's, it's, I think too often we think in terms of, of just small potatoes in development. It's like lots of little NGOs. And in fact, a typical grant will often, the more partners you have doing the more small little things, the better, right? It's like the Christmas tree ornament approach to development <laughs> where we just put all the little ornaments of all the little partners rather than just thinking about how can you work with a smaller number of organizations serving more people. Yeah. And I think that shift in mentality that I think FIGDA will help, and certainly DIV and, and GIF are helping with, is I think critical to us solving that and, and getting to the S, you know, actually achieving the SDGs. I think that's a great place to stop. Thank you, Colin, I really appreciate that. Um, we like to start and stop here on time at CSIS. I wanna thank the panelists and thank Congressman Castro. On a personal note, I would also add, this is my last uh, event at CSIS, as I will be moving on to a new opportunity after this. So I really wanna thank all of you for doing this panel with me for one last time, and thank the audience and those uh, online as well. So thanks so much, guys. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you.